Well, Shalom Aleichem. My name is Aaron Lansky. I am the founder and the president of the Yiddish Book Center. And, uh, and I'm really thrilled to welcome all of you in person, I might add, uh, for today's program. We're thrilled to be back with almost all of our programs now in, in real life. And uh, this promises to be a very interesting afternoon. Uh, today's lecture is the 2023 Melinda Rosenblatt Lecture. The uh, annual series is sponsored by our board chair emeritus, Leif Rosenblatt, and his wife, Johanna, uh, in memory of Melinda Rosenblatt. Over the years, this series has featured some of the most penetrating minds in the field of Jewish studies and related areas. Today's speaker, Jeffrey Weidlinger, is um, no exception to that. Although his topic, in the midst of civilized Europe, Jews in Ukraine in times of war, harkens back to events from 1918, 1919, 1920, uh, it's nonetheless, uh, really it couldn't be more timely as I think you'll, you'll hear. Uh, Jeff is the Joseph Brodsky Collegiate Professor of History and Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. He is the author of a number of prize winning works, uh, all of them deeply researched and beautifully written, and they all explore the past as a way of elucidating the present. Uh, the most recent book, of course, his most recent book, is perhaps the most achingly relevant of all. And that's uh, in the midst of civilized Europe, as you can see on, on the screen in front of you. Um, drawing on long, neglect, on long neglected archival materials, including thousands of newly discovered witness testimonies, trial records, and official orders, Professor Weidlinger shows how these shocking events of 1918 to 1921 presaged the genocide that swept through those same lands uh, two, de two decades later. The book has received numerous awards and recognitions, but perhaps no encomium captures the book's deeper significance uh, better than that of a previous Melinda Rosenblatt lecturer, and that's Professor, Professor Timothy Snyder of Yale University. I'm just gonna read a really quick quote because I just thought it was so perfectly phrased uh, Professor Snyder says, the mass killings of Jews from 1918 to 1921 are a bridge between local pogroms and the extermination of the Holocaust. No history of that Jewish catastrophe comes closer to the virtuosity of research, clarity of prose, and power of analysis of this, uh, that extraordinary book. As the horror of events yields to empathetic understanding, the reader is grateful to Weidlinger for reminding us what history can do. So won't you join me in welcoming Professor Jeffrey Weidlinger. Uh, thank you, Aaron, um, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for making this possible and all of the organizers and to the Melinda Rosenblatt uh, family for, uh, for making this possible as well. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here as well as to be here in person. I love coming out here, haven't been here in a while, um, and nice to be out on a day like today. Um, so I'll talk about the book that I wrote, which came out about a, two years ago. Um, I wanna point out, I've got on the screen here, the cover of the hardcover edition. Uh, when the hardcover edition came out in, what was it, November of 2021, the publisher didn't want to put Ukraine in the title um, because they argued that nobody really cares about Ukraine. And if you want to sell books, you can't put Ukraine in the title. Tragically, by the time the paperback came out, they decided to put Ukraine in the title. And the uh, edition of the paperback edition, which I see they have in the store here, is the pogroms in Ukraine of 1918 to 1921 and the onset of the Holocaust. Um, and I mentioned that because I think it's emblematic, again, of how the past uh, becomes significant to the present. Um, in, as Tim Snyder mentioned in that, uh, uh, in that blurb that so perfectly summarizes the book. And I think it's really no wonder that, you know, the best sentence in my book was written by Tim uh, <laughs> on, the, on the back. But he is a wonderful writer, and I'm grateful to him for that and for, and for his advice on the book. Um, the book actually came out of a project that I was involved with for about 10 years before, 
called AHAME, or the Archives of Historical and Ethnographic Yiddish Memories. And this is a project that I co-directed with my colleague Dov Bear Curler at Indiana University. And between 2000 and 2010, we started traveling through Ukraine, interviewing elderly Yiddish speakers about their life experiences. And it was a predominantly a linguistic project. It was done as an extension of some of you may be familiar with the work that Dovid Katz has done, uh, collecting Yiddish language testimonies in Lithuania. And Dovid traveled with us for the first few expeditions. And we would travel through small towns in Ukraine, looking for people who hopefully are born, were, are still living in the same town that they were born in, in order to interview them about their lives. And Dovid and Dovber had a whole segment of words that they would say in Russian, and they would ask the speaker to repeat in Yiddish, and they were tracing isoglossy. So they were trying to trace how language changes, you know, when an ah changes to an aw, and how different, um, how different sounds adjust uh, dialectically. And so we conducted all of these interviews. And at the end of the interview, there was a segment of free speech where we would just ask the informants, tell us about your life. You know, tell us about life before the war, tell us about the war, tell us about life after the war. And I became struck in these interviews. Um, well, actually, I first wrote a book about all of these interviews called In the Shadow of the Shtetl. That was my previous book that was about Jewish life in the Soviet Union and how Jews in small town Ukraine adjusted to life in the Soviet Union. Um, I was, for that book, I was really impressed with the way that they preserved aspects of their Jewish identity and their religious life um, in the midst of everything that was going on under communism and Nazism. And really, I was interested in the story of how these Yiddish speakers who are still living in small towns in Shtetlach in Ukraine in the 2000s, um, how they'd survived Nazism and how they'd survived communism. But I was also struck in the interviews about these stories that they were telling about the pogroms of 1918 to 1921. And the pogroms of 1918 to 1921, which was the period of what's sometimes called the Russian Civil War, um, I hesitate to use that term civil war because it implies it's a war within the same country, but the people of Ukraine didn't think they were in the same country as Russia um, and still don't. You know, the war going on right now in Ukraine from the Russian perspective is a civil war, right? They think that Ukraine is a breakaway republic, um, whereas Ukrainians uh, rightfully see themselves as independent. So that civil war terminology is a bit problematic, but in any case, uh, pogroms between 1918 to 1921, and I was struck by the stories that they were telling. I knew that the civil war in Russia had been exceedingly violent, and I knew that Jews had been targeted in particular, and I knew that there had been thousands killed during these pogroms, but I didn't quite recognize the extent of it until hearing people who had lived through it themselves tell the story. So I wanna show you a few video clips of people that we interviewed talking about that story. And the first one I'm gonna show is this fellow, Naum Geiviker, who we interviewed about the Praskurov pogrom. And the Praskurov pogrom was the largest of what were about a thousand different pogroms in about 500 different locales. Um, a pogrom is anti-Jewish violence. And there was many different styles and types of anti-Jewish violence. Jews were targeted in a whole variety of ways all around the Russian empire. The Praskurov pogrom took place over the course of four hours in February 1919, um, just a few weeks after the Ukrainian state had been declared. There was a declaration of statehood in Ukraine, and then a unit of the Ukrainian military army came into the town of Praskurov after there had been an attempted Bolshevik takeover. They put down the Bolshevik takeover immediately and then went through the center of town door to door, massacring Jews. In total, about uh, somewhere between 1,000 to 3,000 people were killed over the course of four hours. In what was, at the time, probably the largest single massacre of Jews in a long history of massacres of Jews and in a long history of anti-Jewish violence in Europe. Um, this was probably the single uh, most violent episode. So I'm going to play you clips of this interview. I want to point out Nam Geiviker at the time uh, was quite elderly, and his wife does most of the talking. 
Like he nods along in affirmation, and then at the end he adds a little bit himself, but it's really his wife that you're going to hear. And I could talk extensively about that in oral history and secondhand oral history, but what you're going to hear is his wife talking in Yiddish, him nodding along, and then he'll add a little bit. And so this is in Yiddish uh, with subtitles. And as Armed action of soldiers coming into town and systematically on the signal of a uh, whistle, which he says they signal the, with a whistle, and going literally door to door, rounding up Jews and killing them. Um, it's a type of violence that we associate more with the Holocaust uh, than with pogroms, which we tend to think of as smaller scale race riots. Uh, but this shows that there were actually um, pogroms that took place more as military actions. And we know a lot about the Prescor of pogrom from other sources as well. What you see here is a list that was compiled in the immediate aftermath of the pogrom, documenting the names and ages of those killed. And this is the last page of the list. You can see the last number is 911. So we know at a very minimum, 911 people were killed. We have their names and their ages at the time that they're killed. And you can see their ages range from, I see one who is 12 years old, one who is four years old, two years old, um, up until 73, I see. Um, you can see that they were, they were killing indiscriminately. Uh, the, Allegation was that this was to put down an anti-Bolshevik uprising, but clearly a two-year-old child was not taking place in an anti-Bolshevik uprising. And we know about these pogroms from the work of a lot of lawyers and Yiddish activists who went around in the immediate aftermath of the pogrom and they collected this type of information. Um, here's some other documents that we have telling us about the pogrom from other sources. Um, this is a list compiled. They went door to door asking people who in this household was killed in the violence of February 15th, 1919. And you can see one household lists five people who were killed. And then they surveyed the population as well and went around with surveys saying, can you tell me about the pogrom that took place in this city? So we have a plethora of information. And in fact, in 1923, I think it is, or maybe 1924, 
a memorial book, a Yisker book, was issued for the Preskur of Pogrom, of the type that we associate more commonly actually with Holocaust Yisker Bicher. Um, you may be familiar with Holocaust Yisker Bicher, and in fact, I begin my book with an account of this book, uh, which talks about those who were killed um, in the violence. And you can see that it really evokes Holocaust imagery, even with the barbed wire um, and the Podolian countryside in the background. Um, and it's a book in memory of those who were killed in the Preskur of Pogrom. So as I said, the Preskur of Pogrom was just one of about 500 different incidents, or sorry, about, yeah, about 1,000 different incidents in 500 different locations, um, with many locations experience, po experiencing multiple pogroms during this four-year period. And this is a map that shows where some of those pogroms took place with the size of the circle proportionate to the number of fatalities. Um, you can see Preskuriv over there, all the way to the, uh, all the way on the western side, uh, was one of the largest. And I showed you the names of 911 people. Those people are the people who were killed immediately. We can then estimate that another, that three times that many died as a result of their wounds, or died of starvation, or died because their housing uh, was taken away from them um, as a result of the violence. And this was confirmed in 1921 when the Soviet government came into the area and they did a survey. They took many lists. There's hundreds of these lists that you can find in the Yivo archives. Um, and the Soviet government took those lists and then statistically went into the towns to try to figure out how many people had actually been killed. And they concluded the lists document the names of about a third of the total victims. So they counted those lists have 34,000 names on them. So we know the names of 34,000 people who were killed in these pogroms, and we can estimate that about three times that many actually died. Um, even if they didn't die directly, they died of their wounds or they died of starvation or disease as a direct result of the pogroms. So that's how we get the figure of 100,000 fatalities uh, during this period uh, of violence. I wanna play you another clip of another person telling us about their experiences of pogroms in Tulchin which is another town in Podolia. And this is a very different type of pogrom. And I use these two testimonies of all the testimonies because they really represent two extremes of the different ways that this violence can take place. The first, again, is a military unit coming into town and systematically over the course of four days, rounding up the Jewish population and killing them. This testimony is more along the lines of what you may associate as a traditional pogrom. It is committed by locals, by kids, essentially, who live in the surrounding countryside, by Ukrainian peasants who live in the surrounding countryside, a group called the Lyachovich Gang. And he'll say the Lyachovich Band, Band of Lyachovich. Uh, and it takes place over an extended period of time, about eight days, uh, he says, it takes place, uh, during which these local peasants are terrorizing the town and also results in many deaths. And I'll talk about how many after. What he's going to describe to us, just to let you know, um, is he's going to talk about how his family was murdered in a mass grave. And he was a one and a half month old child at the time. And he's going to roll up his sleeve and show us a scar on his arm. And that scar is where he says the bullet that killed his mother ricocheted off his body as she was holding him in her arms. And a Polish priest then came by a little bit later and found this mass grave and saw there was a baby alive in the mass grave and took him out and saved him. So that's his narrative. Um, again, you know, from an oral history perspective, he obviously doesn't remember this himself. He was 18 months, um, but he has the scar and he'll show us, he'll say, this is the scar to prove it. She could get my foot she can answer the Jordan, the Ranit, and foot him with a meter and drag it. And answer the Jordan has given the ganzen two Jordan. Oh! Where is the Ranit? Where is the Ranit? Bandelichovic. He was shot, the Bandit. He was there to play the pulley. He was there to play. And the dog kicked the pork. Mm -hmm. Vidna, Vidna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
a pole como la gente que me tú sabes que pueden dar acciones a fnugel no te mojaban que me me da yo roto el motor que yo lo veo me ha dado la vida mi afuera ven mi apay que me afuera ojo se te va mi apay que me afuera en la meta ‫אינה זיידה, אשנאדה. ‫-מי עוד אמת על גייסן? ‫גיטל. ‫בית הזה אין גיבן פון דונלד? ‫שיקי יום. ‫שיקי ספון דולשין. ‫נה, שיקי מנהב. ‫תפו את המנהב גייסן שיקי. ‫-יא, יא. ‫-יא, ספון דולשין. ‫יא. ‫הרבינה פייק מחר. ‫עוד נבי פחטוק, ננצת ניו. ‫בין הפגרום, ‫אין תולשין, ‫הם אותו אתגר ידוסו, ‫בוגרים, ‫תמן ידוסו, ‫אוזגר ידמיה, חוסר לילה. ‫איזה אוזגר הגורל אשר, ‫הגורך, ברדוצ'אן, ‫אין עוד זה, ‫את פה ודה בנדית אלה. ‫אין זה נתנו גבי אינפלד אשר. So that testimony is another harrowing testimony, um, but it talks about a very different type of violence, and you can get a feel for the variety of ways that these pogroms took place. I have here another written account of the same pogrom that confirms a lot of what he says. Um, this is an account that he, I mean, he couldn't have known of it. This is an account from the Evo archives that were collected by Cherikover. Um, and you'll see, I mean, for those of you who read Yiddish, um, first of all, you'll see that he says it took place in August 1919 um, and was committed by the Lyachovich gang. All right, so here he has Lyachovich in Yiddish and also in Russian, if any of you could read it, um, saying that this pogrom took place. In this account, it took place over the course of 24 hours instead of eight days. But this account says that there were several pogroms over the course of eight days. So it just depends if you consider you know, each one to be a separate incident or if you're counting all of them together. And he says 500 people were killed um, in this pogrom according to this account. And this account notably also interestingly talks about a delegation of priests who came in and put an end to the pogrom. So there's a lot of little uh, clues in this account uh, that verify uh, uh, to verify our informant's story. He also talks about violence that's perpetrated by neighbors. This is the Lyachovich gang, and everybody seems to know who the Lyachovich gang are. They are a gang of local peasants, and much of this violence was perpetrated against local, uh, was perpetrated by locals against people in the town. And the reason for this is there is a big difference between townspeople and country people, between town folk and rural folk um, in Ukraine. The town folk tended to be Jewish, and Jews tended to live in towns. It's still, you know, if you go to the Shtetlach today, you'll see that the center of town looks as old Jewish buildings. And as you move out from town uh, into the surrounding countryside, it gets more Christian. And the statistics of Tulchin really show us that. So here's, for instance, occupational diversity in Tulchin in 1926. Um, Dovber Kurler, my partner who record, you know, who you, whose voice you heard in that interview, keeps asking about what occupations they all had. And you can see that a lot of occupations were Jewish occupations. Coopers, glazers, coachmen, tailors, dentists, hairdressers, um, which in the transcript I translated as barbers, um, but hairdressers, barbers, uh, were overwhelmingly Jewish whereas railroad workers and farmers were not. And if you look at the distribution of Jews versus non-Jews in Ukraine as a whole, you can see that Ukraine as a whole was 90% rural in 1926. Only 11% of the population lived in cities. Whereas the Jewish population, 91% lived in cities and only 9% in the countryside. So the cities were really Jewish. 
which is where the professions were, where the artisans were, where the workers were, the blacksmiths, the coopers, the glazers. And that's why all those occupations are so important. Even in the other, uh, the Praskurov account that I played you, you could hear he talked about they went down the street of Sabornaya Ulitsa, he says, which is Church Street. As you can well imagine, you know, Church Street may sound like it was in a Christian part of town, um, but it actually wasn't because the church was in the very center of town. Church Street is the major is the major street in town that leads to the church, but alongside it are all of the Jewish businesses. So that's the Jewish center of town. So again, the center of town is Jewish and the uh, suburbs or the rural areas are not. And certain occupations, again, are overwhelmingly Jewish. So I point all this out to say that this battle going on, this attacks on the Jews are not motivated solely on the basis of religious anti-Semitism or political anti-Semitism, but are also part of a town versus country dynamic and part of a socio-economic fight happening, part of a so part of socio-economic um, resentment and not just religious resentment. Um, another thing I want to point out in the Tulchin reference is the way these Polish priests stop the pogrom. First of all, they're Polish priests, not Ukrainian priests, um, because Pol Polish Catholics are also living in the towns as opposed to the countryside. And this pogrom seems to progress to a point where they allow it to happen. The local authorities, the trusted priests, for instance, allow it to happen at a certain point. But then once it reaches the massacre, the Polish priest says, enough, everybody go home, and they do go home. Um, that's not possible in the Praskur pogrom, in the ones that are perpetrated by the military units. You can't have a respected authority come out and say, enough, everybody go home. And this, you know, the role of the church in these pogroms is really crucial, what the church does, and more importantly, when they do it, if they stop it early enough, um, it can put an end to the pogroms. But so who perpetrated these pogroms? Well, we have this chart that was compiled in about 1920, blaming various groups for who perpetrated the pogroms. And you'll see the Poles here are um, blamed for 38, in this instance, 38 pogroms um, is, the, is the Poles. Uh, all of these pogroms, I should say, are taking place in an area that used to be the Russian Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Those two empires collapse in 1917, 1918, the Russian and the Austro-Hungarian empires collapse, and all of these new states start to vie for authority in that power vacuum. So a Polish national state is established that lays claim to the territory of Ukraine. A Russian imperial state or military unit is established called the White Army or the Volunteer Army, which is led by Denikin. You can see over there, he's, they say he's responsible for 93 pogroms. Um, and then there's a Ukrainian state that's also being established. And the Ukrainian state is, established, is responsible for 54 pogroms. There's also the Red Army, which is trying to take over the entire area for the Soviets, what is going to be the Soviet Union for the Bolshevik government. And then there's these bands, which are simply peasant bands that are roaming the area, um, like the perpetrators of the Tulchin pogrom. So these are people with no particular political ideology. Sometimes they're flying a white flag of the white Imperial Russian army. Sometimes they're flying a red flag. Sometimes the same unit flies a white flag one day and a red flag the next day. These are really military units, militias, groups of armed peasants who are just trying to take some power in this vacuum. So I want to talk a little bit about the Ukrainian state um, because the Praskura pogrom is perpetrated by armies of the Ukrainian militia. That is to say there's a real tragedy of what happens in Ukraine at this time because the Ukrainian state that is established in 1918 purports to be a multinational state. In contrast to the Polish state that is a ethnic national state for Poles only, the Ukrainian state very deliberately the people who claimed statehood in Ukraine claim to be doing so as a multinational venture. They actually grant Jews national autonomy, not autonomy as individuals, like not as a, you can be free people like you are in Great Britain or like you are in the United States, but that the Jewish community will be a recognized national entity as part of the state. They were, for instance, given a cabinet position there is a minister of Jewish affairs, a secretary of Jewish affairs in the government, 
Uh, they had the right to taxation and to use taxes for their own purposes, and Yiddish was made an official language. And you see that in this currency, this uh, 100 uh, Karbovanets notes, that is printed on one side in Ukrainian, and here on the opposite side, you can see Russian, Polish, and at the bottom, Yiddish, which is, to the best of my knowledge, the first time that Yiddish language was ever printed on a state currency. And it was printed on Ukrainian state currency in 1918. The tragedy is that this state, which by and large really does seem to embody multicultural, multinational um, ideals, is, well, first, it's celebrated around the world. I just have this quote from the Yiddish language, Der Tog, celebrating the establishment of the Ukrainian state, saying, for the first time in all Jewish history, the Jewish people will be recognized by a government as an equal part of the general population, not only in a civil and political sense, but in a national sense. So really, the whole world saw this Ukrainian state as the embodiment of a new type of pluralism and multiculturalism. But within a month of being established, it is invaded by a Polish army, by a Russian imperial white army, and by the Bolshevik red army. And that creates total chaos. And the military units, Simon Petlura is the head of the Ukrainian state, he's unable to keep track of what his own troops are doing, and it's total chaos. And they all turn on the Jews. All of these armies that I've just mentioned commit atrocities against the Jews. Um, which I often point out these days to say that, you know, anti-Semitism is not a Ukrainian problem and was not even a Ukrainian problem in 1918 to 1921. It was a European-wide problem. And every entity in Europe that was able to participate in anti-Jewish uh, violence did so as soon as there was a collapse of political authority. Uh, so it's by no means anything particular to Ukraine. It's just that Ukraine had the tragedy of being in a state of total chaos for so long that it allowed for this anti-Semitism to, uh, to rise up. And what were the motivations then of the pogroms? Well, I have this slide. Of, I don't know if you can see it all that well, um, but it's from the town of Zhytomyr in Ukraine. And it's a destroyed store. It's a dry goods store in Ukraine that has been raided. And it's just piles of stuff. You can see empty shelves and everything's been thrown into the middle of the store. And the reason is because Jews owned the dry goods stores in the center of town, as they did, by the way, in America. I'm writing a book now about the America, about Jewish settlements in the Great Plains of America. And there in Oklahoma and Texas, in the center of town, Missouri, Kansas City, probably right here in Massachusetts, in the center of town, there were dry goods stores, department stores that tended to be owned by Jews. And it was the same thing in Ukraine. And if you are a Ukrainian soldier, or perhaps just a peasant, but whatever, um, you're in the midst of war and have been since 1914, Ukraine was at war, uh, in first the Great War and then this complete breakdown of authority. They're hungry, they don't have food, they've not been able to farm because of the situation of war and the men have been off fighting instead of farming the land. So people are literally starving. And the army couldn't feed, the army had just been established of the Ukrainian state. And one month later, they can't feed their troops. So they would tell the troops, we're gonna crush the Bolshevik rebellion in this city, and then you can provision yourselves in the center of town. You can requisition food from the locals. And that requisitioning of food from the locals often meant a pogrom. Uh, similarly, even clothing was requisitioned. So they couldn't provide uniforms. So they would say, we're gonna invade this town, and there's a leather works in the town. So once we get into town, go to the leather works and requisition leather. And we actually have reports. I mean, we can read the diaries of these soldiers and the soldiers say, we moved into X town on whatever day and we requisitioned 500 uniforms from the local clothing people. And then you can look at the Jewish accounts and they say on this day, the military came in and they committed atrocities against us and robbed us and killed us and took all of our, all of our goods. So that's often what these pogroms were, was motivated simply by a lack of resources, by a need for food, a need for clothing, a need for supplies. And the clothing and the food and the supplies um, were held by predominantly Jewish-owned stores. So that's one important motivation. It's nothing to do with religion, um, nothing per se to do with anti-Semitism, except maybe the perception that all Jews 
have these supplies. Uh, but a lot of it was just robbing these stores. Then another large part was the accusation that Jews and Bolsheviks are one and the same. Now, of course, they weren't, but many Jews did side with the Bolsheviks in this rebellion. And so when Ukrainian armies or Russian imperial armies or Polish armies, for that matter, were told to crush the Bolsheviks in a city, they often turned their attention to the Jews and killed the Jews instead. And the Russian imperial army under General Denikin, Anton Denikin, really encouraged this and printed anti-Semitic postcards and leaflets that deliberately tied the Bolsheviks to the Jews. What you see here is a postcard titled The Coat of Arms of Lev Trotsky. And you can see it's a perversion of the Russian imperial double eagle. The, real, the symbol of the Russian empire was a double eagle. But instead of an eagle, it's very stereotypical caricature of Jewish faces with the hooked nose and the big lips and the big eyes and the pince nez. Um, the shield has a star of David, but has a star of David and the word Talmud in it. And uh, it's holding, instead of a scepter and a Fabergé egg, it's holding a fish and an onion, you know, or a garlic rather, foods associated with Jews. Uh, so this is designed to convince ordinary people that the Bolsheviks and the Jews are one and the same. Here's another one that more deliberately takes old anti-Semitic ideas that are just embedded within all European culture and implies it to the Bolsheviks or applies it to the Bolsheviks. Um, pre predominantly, the idea that Jews killed Christ. So here you have Jesus being led to the cross. And who is leading Jesus? Who's playing the role of the Pharisees or the Jews? It's Bolshevik Red Army soldiers and sailors who are leading Christ to the cross. And they're looking down at the side is Lev Trotsky, uh, who is well known as somebody of Jewish origins. Now, it's interesting, you know, Lev Trotsky, of course, was not the head of the Bolsheviks. The head of the Bolsheviks was Vladimir Lenin. But he was sitting there in Petrograd in St. Petersburg. The face of the revolution, and truly the face of the Russian Revolution to most of the world, was Leon Trotsky, Lev Trotsky. Trotsky was the head of the Red Army, and he was also the Minister of Foreign Affairs. When the Russians first, when the, when the Bolsheviks first took power in Russia, they immediately sent a delegation to negotiate with the great powers in Brest-Litovsk, and they sent Trotsky. Trotsky was the face of the revolution to most of the world. And the enemies of the Bolsheviks played upon this idea by implying that all Bolsheviks were Jews like Trotsky, and therefore you should hate them. It's a very effective technique because the Bolsheviks were going out there in the countryside promising land, bread, and peace. If you are a peasant living in Ukraine in 1919, land, bread, and peace sound awfully good. And there's a good chance that you're gonna go over to the side of the Bolsheviks. So what do the anti-Bolshevik forces do? They tell the peasants through things like this, hey, you know, all that stuff that's being promised to you by the Bolsheviks, those are just the Jews, you know. You can't trust the Jews. You know that they killed Christ. Um, how can you trust them? And try to bring about this association between Jews and Bolsheviks that becomes very strong. And then you get these peasants saying, well, I agree with the Bolshevik principles of land, bread, and peace, but I can't trust them because they're Jews. And that association between Jews and Bolsheviks gets strengthened because you know what else Trotsky does is at a certain point, he alone cracks down on pogroms. His army, the Red Army, committed some of the first anti-Jewish atrocities. They do so because they associate Jews as the bourgeoisie and capitalists. So when the Bolsheviks come into town, they target Jews because they're capitalists. Ironically, the capitalists are targeting Jews because they're Bolsheviks. At the same time, by the way, the Ukrainians target the Jews because they think the Jews are allying with the Poles, and the Poles target Jews because they say they're allying with the Ukrainians. The Russians accuse them of being pro-German, and the Germans accuse them of being pro-Russian. Every side has a Jew they can blame, and every side blames the Jews for all of, the, um, all of the ills that are befalling them. So this is the tragic fate of why each group targets Jews. But what happens over the course of 1919 is the Red Army stops targeting Jews. Trotsky really cracks down on anti-Jewish violence among his soldiers. 
And he sees if a soldier or a unit commits atrocities against Jews, he executes the leader of that, uh, of that division. He takes real action against people who perpetrate atrocities against Jews. The Jews start to hear about this and they realize it. And their response is to join the Red Army because the Red Army comes to town. So you got these towns like Tulchin and one day a Ukrainian army is in killing Jews, the next day a Russian army. Every army seems to come into town and the first thing they do is round up the Jews. And they take those Jews to the outskirts of town and they often kill them. The Red Army though, on the other hand, they come into town, they also round up the Jews and they say to the Jews, we have saved you. We've saved you and we're gonna station here and we're here to stay. Soviet power is here to stay. Now come join us and help us liberate the Jews in the next town over. And a lot of Jews who had been involved in self-defense brigades beforehand realize that you know, their little self-defense brigades with the, you know, there was a needle tailors, uh, needle workers union that had a self-defense brigade with the tools of their trade. But they realized the Red Army has machine guns and they're offering the Jews to come join them. And they do. And this has a snowball effect because as the Red Army goes from town to town, more Jews join the Red Army. And that association between Jews and the Red Army becomes even stronger. So there really is the, this period of 1918 to 1921 brings a very strong association between Jews and Bolsheviks, and for reasons that are understandable, because Jews are flocking to join the Bolsheviks um, and the Red Army, at the same time that the enemies of the Red Army are trying to associate it with Jews. I want to take a minute and talk about some of these warlords, some of these uh, bandits that we've talked about, like the Lyachovich gang. One of the most feared groups of bandits, not the Lyachovich gang, was the Ilya Struk gang. And here you see a photo of some of Struk's soldiers. And I want to point out that they don't look very fearsome. They're basically kids. These are kids 16, 17, 18 years old. Maybe they're kids, maybe they're legally adults, whatever, 19 even. Um, but they're playing dress up, you know, making themselves look like Cossack horsemen, when in reality, they're just peasants. They're just 18, 19 year old peasants wearing outfits that don't fit them. You know, they're playing dress up in a photographic studio. And these are the people who are going into town and killing. And we often have um, accounts of their parents saying, yeah, I told him not to do this. You know, I said, Mitri, don't go into town. Don't do, you know, don't cause trouble with the Jews, but he went anyway. Uh, there's a generational thing going on here too, where children who are about 16 years of old, years, of, years old, have lived for six years under total war and chaos. And all they know is fighting and they're frustrated by it. They're hungry, you know, they feel brave and they think, you know, we're, I'm gonna save my family from starvation. I'm gonna go into town. I'm gonna get those Jews and I'm gonna steal their money and bring it back. So there's a lot of that going on um, where there are young peasants who are doing this. And what ends up happening in 1921 is the Bolsheviks take power and Soviet government is established in this area. And the Soviet government really cracks down on banditry. Um, in fact, both of the accounts that I played you, they use the term bandits, right? Bandits came into town, and that's because the crime was banditry. And so they're parroting the language of the official crime. So banditry was a counter-revolutionary activity. As a result, in 1921, the Bolsheviks set up tribunals, revolutionary tribunals. And these tribunals went from town to town and meted out justice to the perpetrators of atrocities against anybody, but also against Jews. And what you see here is a death sentence that was given to two peasants in a town, the town of Slovichna, um, one of whom is listed as being uh, 25, 26 years of age, and another one who's listed as being 18 years of age, which means at the time of the pogroms, they were 14, and they were 24. So young people, I think that's right, maybe it's 18, but in any case, uh, um, I can't see it right now, but in any case, they were, they were pretty young at the, time of the, at the time of the pogrom. And now this unit is coming in and you know, giving them death sentences. And you can see actually that the names of the people who headed the tribunal, the chief judge here, his name is Feldman, and the secretary of the tribunal, the other guy is, uh, is his name is Ratner, two very noticeably Jewish names. So what it looks like to these peasants is now 
the Jews are in charge, just like the, they said they'd be, you know, just like all of these anti-Bolshevik forces said they'd be, and they're coming into town, they're killing our kids. And, you know, he was only, Dmitri, in this case, his name's uh, Dmitri Dmitsky, I think, is, you know, he was only 16 at the time, and yeah, he got into some trouble, but look, now what they're doing is they're coming in, now that they're in charge, they're coming in, they're killing our children, um, just like they said would happen. So this creates a animosity in town that this is 1921 that this takes place. It's only 20 years before the Germans occupy the area. And when the Germans occupy the area, they tell the local population, remember what the Jews did to you 20 years earlier. Um, remember this moment. And they revive the rhetoric of the anti-Bolshevik uh, rhetoric that was used during this period uh, in order to perpetrate further and much, uh, you know, much more extensive atrocities against the Jews. I want to just take a couple minutes at the end to show you uh, images and show you some of the uh, figures who were most involved with collecting this information and delivering aid, because we know about what happened through the efforts of uh, people like Elliot Sherikover, um, who collected aid and sent, uh, sent people over to get testimonies. Um, that's the, the, test, the testimonies, the written testimonies I showed you at the beginning came from his collections, uh, Nochem Stift as well, um, who was also a Yiddish linguist who collected testimonies and delivered aid. Um, and then we know about it from stories that were written. It's a Kipnis, the Yiddish writer, um, wrote a book about the Slovich na pogrom that I think a lot of people at first thought was a novel, but really is a chronicle. It's an account. It confirmed, conforms almost exactly to the testimonies that we have of this pogrom. Um, he puts it in the voice of a child, um, but he's really describing what was a real pogrom. And Rochel Feigenberg as well, um, who wrote about the destruction of the town of Dubova, uh, also, you know, in these Yiddish accounts. It's interesting because if you look at material that was written in the 1920s and 1930s, I mean, you may not know about these pogroms. This is probably, you know, maybe the first that many of you are hearing about these pogroms. But if you look at Yiddish literature from the period, it seems that it's all anybody was writing about, um, that the pogroms were very much in people's mind. And I'll just skip ahead a little bit to show you that it was also covered extensively in the newspapers at the time um, and since has been overshadowed. And this is a headline that I like to show from the New York Times in September 1919, saying a mass meeting here is that 127,000 Jews have been killed and 6 million are in peril. And I'll just show you the last line of this slide, and I think I'll end on this slide, showing that people were aware of the atrocities that were happening um, in 1919 and anticipated it as just the first wave in something worse. Um, and in fact, the last line of this is, this fact that the population of six million souls in Ukraine and in Poland have received notice through action and by word that they are going to be completely exterminated, this fact stands before the whole world as the paramount issue of the present day. Um, that's from September 1919. So as you can see, the pogroms had a tremendous impact on the world at the time. And actually Jews did, you know, I, you may wonder what did Jews do to stop it, right? If they predicted that this was going to happen 20 years later, why didn't they stop it? And I'll just say briefly, the answer is they did. They did everything they possibly could. They petitioned the great powers who were meeting in Paris to get minority rights inserted into the constitutions of Poland and Romania. They tried to establish their own state in Palestine and migrated to Palestine to build up their own state for the purpose of safety. They migrated in mass numbers, both to the Russian interior, to Moscow and St. Petersburg, and to the United States, to Germany, to Western Europe, anything they could um, to get out of there. And they joined the Red Army uh, and joined the Bolshevik Party and the Bolshevik Civil Service as a possible way of moving up and securing the safety of more Jews. The real tragedy is that they did everything that they possibly could, and it wasn't enough. Um, anyway, I will end on that note and happy to take, uh, take some questions about any of this. I know it's a lot of material.